I'm Dr. Alyssa Watson. And I'm Dr. Beth Mollison. Thanks for joining us again today in the veterinary break room. In the vet break room, Dr. Beth and I have short conversations where we just chat informally about relevant topics in veterinary medicine. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about breed stereotypes. Um, Dr. Beth and I don't like to shy away from controversy. <laughs> <laughs> So we thought this might be actually just a kind of fun thing to talk about. There was a um, study that came out earlier in 2022 um, in the in the Journal of Science that we're going to touch on a little bit about, you know, whether or not breeds actually do have stereotypical behaviors and should you use that information in order to um, help guide you on what breed you should choose. But before we get into that, we were going to just talk a little bit about our favorite breeds. So, Dr. Beth, do you have a favorite breed of dog? Yeah, I love this question, Alyssa. And like you said, this episode makes me nervous. I, I feel like we all know we have strong, well, maybe not all of us, but a lot of us have, I feel like, developed maybe strong opinions about certain breeds. And it's always scary to voice those publicly because our opinions can vary so much in our personal experiences um, and on and on. But I like talking about my own favorite breeds. So I I feel like there are two breeds that anyone that knows me associates with me. That's because I've owned them both. But um, greyhounds, I became a greyhound lady in vet school. We, of course, had exposure because we had greyhounds around for um, blood donation. So I adopted two greyhounds in vet school. Uh, when we're talking about like what draws us to the breed, I love big dogs, but I don't consider myself like super high energy. So I love that greyhounds are, um, you know, we're amenable to my apartment lifestyle and busy vet school lifestyle. Uh, I know like the stoic behavior is kind of off putting to some people. I love that. I love that they're like almost cat like. Um, and then I'm also a really big dogs in person. I think for me, there's a common aesthetic there. I like Looks wise, I like the the short hair. Again, low energy here. Not a lot of grooming. Um, I like the short hair. I like how funny looking they are. I think both breeds have kind of that funny aesthetic. Um, and then dachshunds, you know, they're moderate energy, but they love to cuddle, and that's that's what who Paul is, my dachshund. He fits the stereotypical dachshund bill pretty well. Um, so I would say those are probably my favorite, although I guess there's a risk that maybe any breed I owned would wind up wind up weaseling its way into a top, you know, favorite breeds of my heart list. But what about you, Alyssa? Yeah, I'm, I'm very curious to hear this answer from you. It's funny that you say that because so when I got out of vet school, my first dog that was my dog, you know, my adult dog, my first dog that I went and specifically got to be my companion. And then also I had just graduated. And so I did all her care. You know, I, I spayed mm -hmm. her, I gastropexied her, I did all of her puppy vaccines, I took her to training, you know, she was my heart dog. And that was a Great Dane. And I had wanted a Great Dane for years and years and years. My uncle, um, my one of my aunts and uncles owned Great Danes, and um, I had just loved them. So not only am I a big dog person, but I'm kind of a, a big breed of whatever species we're looking at. You know, my my <laughs> grandfather had a dairy farm in Iowa, and so he had Belgians um, and I think one or two Percherons. So I loved, you know, big draft horses. That's what I was always drawn to. Uh, when I was little, I had a rabbit. And so, of course, I had to have a giant Flemish. I have to have the big thing of whatever. <laughs> So that's interesting, Alyssa. <laughs> you do have a type. I do. Like. I have a type. So, um, so yeah, so I love the big dogs and Great Danes are, you know, that, that was my heart dog. That was everything. And then I ended up with my current dog, who is a dog de Bordeaux. Uh, she fell into my lap. Um, you know, if she was not one that I was looking for, it just turned mm -hmm. out that she needed a home. She couldn't stay in the home that she was already in because there was inner dog aggression issues. And now that has jumped up to, you know, possibly my favorite breed. <laughs> now, sure. I, I still don't think it's going to replace Great Danes. I think, you know, 
in the future, we will probably have, I will probably have great Danes again. Always be a Dane person. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it got me thinking, you know, especially for you, because I knew you were going to say dachshunds because I know all about Paul (laughs) and his racing. (laughs) Everyone that knows me is forced to know all about Paul, yes. And so, but I was curious, do you know, when you talk about your favorite breed to own is that, do you like to see dachshunds in the clinic too? Because I would have to say sometimes great Danes in the clinic are a little sketch. Yeah. I was going to say, I feel like you're really throwing dachshunds into the the spotlight there at the clinic because you're, you're right. Perhaps they are not my favorite breed. That's actually not true. I think I am so obsessed with them. I will happily see an angry dachshund just to be able to laugh at their little body and enjoy how ridiculous they are. But are you going to put a catheter in that tiny little leg? (laughs) See, you're you're having your very wonderful, experienced veterinary technicians do that. That, that's exactly right. Um, no, that it's an interesting, it's an interesting point. Cause the other thing too, I think when we talk about, when we both talked about our breeds, a lot of it for us was, I think there's two components to a favorite breed. It's what do they look like? And then of course, what do they act like? Mm-hmm. Which I think maybe is more when we talk about stereotypes, what we talk about. Um, because I do think that of course, when you're talking about a veterinary patient, a lot of us, we look at that schedule and we see the breed on there and we get these preconceived notions of what is that appointment going to be like? And it's very interesting because I would say, I don't necessarily think that dachshunds are my favorite, favorite breed to, to walk through the door, even though I do enjoy it, but for the reasons you, you listed and maybe their stereotype of some of their behaviors that they can have. I think if I had to choose one breed that I want to see walk through the door, and this is a tough one. I think I'm going to go Beagle. I like, I feel like they're generally have a positive disposition in the clinic. They're food motivated. Mm. I feel like they're a hearty breed. So maybe you're not seeing, you know, I don't know, medical wise, of course, they can all have their issues, but um, nothing big jumps out at me. I like that they have short hair so they didn't just like run through a mud puddle and now they smell and they're covered in mud. So I think I'm going to go Beagle if I had to choose a breed to walk through the door. What about you, Alyssa? Is it the same as your Dane um, Dog Day Bordeaux list or are you choosing somebody else? So, yeah. So that is, I, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to say, I would just rather have, I know this isn't answering the question, but I would rather have a large or giant breed dog walk through the door than a Fair. chihuahua or a, <laughs> you know, um, I'll have to say pit bulls. We see a lot of pit bulls in Vegas, lots and lots. Mm-hmm. Pit bulls and chihuahuas, I like, are the bread mm-hmm. and butter. There was what's walking in over and over and over. And I'd, I'd sure. rather go for the pit bull, you know, generally <laughs> short hair, easy to hit veins. I like it. Mm-hmm. That's that's true. There's a lot of positive, a lot of positives there. I think that's the other thing I should say for the beagle. I like that they fit up on the exam table. Mm-hmm. I like that if I'm doing an orthopedic exam, I can manipulate their bodies. Um, but who would be? I don't know if you're going to say Chihuahuas. Who would be your least favorite breed based on stereotype to see you walk through the door? It's actually not Chihuahuas. So, and it, it comes from personal experience. So, I'm not a huge Shepherd fan. I, the only time I've ever gone to the hospital in 20 years, you know, being injured by a patient was a shepherd. I got bit up pretty bad on my arm by a shepherd uh, when I, and the dog had given me no warning, no warning whatsoever. It was fine for the exam. And then I Mm -hmm. went to do an otic exam and Mm -hmm. I just barely touched his ear penna and he turned and chomped on my arm a couple of (laughs) times. Oh gosh, yes, that is uh, a good enough reason to maybe not want to see one waltz through the yeah. <laughs> through the door anytime and, soon. You know, and I think then they know you're scared of them too. So, mm-hmm. and that they they can feed off that. It's probably another stereotype, but I feel like they know I'm scared of them. Yeah, no, I I think that's very true. They can feel the energy around you and it makes them nervous. And then, of course, we all know fear can be a perpetuator of maybe some of those negative behaviors in the clinic. Yeah. So I think I would have to say maybe 
Oh, maybe a husky. Sorry, husky people out there. Um, <laughs> I know that's why when we were talking about doing this episode, I felt like we're just going to have to apologize to all the people that, you know, love the breed. <laughs> Everybody's different. Exactly. And there's there, I think for me, it's the noise. I feel like huskies make I, the huskies that I know make special noises when they come to the clinic that don't sit well with me. Um, I have had a few, and to me, that's we're talking talking about behaviors that I find uh, unsettling in the clinic. It's that unpredictability. I have experienced a few unpredictable huskies that I think have scarred me, and then there's that vicious fear cycle that you mentioned, where you're afraid, they're afraid, and then it just is bound not to go well. Um, so yeah, I think based on stereotype, that is maybe <clears throat> the breed that I may not look forward to. Yep. Though <laughs> the um, basset hounds, again, I think it's so funny because we talk about stereotypes, but honestly, for me, it's like, it's the one patient that then I base every other, <laughs> every yes, other dog of that of breed. Them. I stereotype mm-hmm. off of that one patient. And we, I had a, a basset hound named Wally that I saw for years and years and years. And I loved him, but so loud, so loud. I don't know how these people lived with this <laughs> yep. dog. Like I would call them for follow-ups and you could hear him howling oh in the background. Gosh. You could hear him in the parking lot. I knew whenever he was there, like before they even came in the door. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. That the noise pollution gets to me too. Um, and when we talk about, you know, we talk about those one individuals that then of course kind of color our picture of of pet behavior. And going back to that study that you mentioned, um, Alyssa, it was, like you said, a study in the Journal of Science titled Ancestry Inclusive Dog Genomics Challenges Popular Breed Stereotypes. And what they did, and maybe someone uh, smarter than me could interpret this study a little bit better, but trying to make sense of exactly what the protocol was, it looks like they coupled data from owner surveys about their pet's behavior and compared it to kind of a genomic mapping. So, you know, did all these pets with certain behaviors have the same gene types? And it was a huge population. I mean, we're talking way bigger populations than I am normally used to seeing in studies. And and I think it's worth saying, too, that these were geneticists, you know, not veterinarians that mm-hmm. did this study. Um, but I think they had like 18,000 survey results. Yep. So a lot. Yep. And and yep. yeah, my understanding is just like yours. They took that, They they had the the genomic, you know, genetic material from all these dogs, and they actually sequence their DNA, looking for specific, you know, spots, loc- um, loci, loci, what are they? <laughs> Your one's fine with me, Alyssa. <laughs> um, looking for t- specific spots and compared that to, you know, um, eight m- traits and, and a lot of things they kind of broke down looking into, you know, was, is the breed... Uh, very independent versus um, very responsive to human training. Yeah, it was it was interesting, and we'll link the study for anybody that wants to um, to look further into it. But one of their big takeaways was that dog breed is generally a poor predictor of individual behavior and should not be used to inform a lot of decision making, especially relating to selection of a pet. Which I honestly found very fascinating because I think you and I, of course, both have worked with a lot of pets. And to me, of course, I'm biased to my own stereotypes, but it seems like a lot of these stereotypes do add up and and it could just be maybe the format of exactly what the study was looking at. But the results, again, were very, very interesting to find that maybe there wasn't as close of a relationship as we might have predicted. Right. They did find a very close relationship, obviously, between physical traits and breed, which, you know, you and I were talking makes total sense. You know, that's why a poodle looks like a poodle. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Much more closely tied to the looks of a breed. And of course, there's a lot more individual variation in behavior. So it makes sense. I mean, the other thing, too, I feel like we'd be remiss to have this conversation and not not mention mixed breed dogs. But I was thinking about this the other day, Alyssa. I feel like I grew up with just a bunch of Heinz 57s that always were wonderful and different from each other. But as a vet, I feel like because we are exposed to so many dogs and we get to experience so many different breeds, for some reason that has drawn me more toward 
certain rather than picking a a mutt mm-hmm. i feel more drawn toward getting a um a full bred dog uh just because of that because i'm like oh i think a poodle would be fun to have or i think mm-hmm. again a greyhound would be fun to have i just feel like that exposure has led me away from mixed breed dogs do you feel like you've experienced that at all or are you still in the heinz 57 group at all so i guess i've never thought about it until you just brought it up right now but i think i'm probably <laughs> like you yeah i think as i've gotten you know older and more experienced with different breeds, you know, that is one thing. Yeah. You see one or you have a patient that you really love and, and you're like, wow, this, this dog, you know, would fit into my home really well, you know, and the hope would be that another dog of that same breed would have a similar, you know, personality trait. It was funny when we were talking earlier, we were listing things, you know, stereotypes about why we like to see certain dogs in the clinic and, and just listening to us talk, several of those were physical. They were physical traits. Remember we were talking about, we like the short hair. We like, you know, I'm like, I, I don't want personally, you know, I prefer if dogs are not hugely brachycephalic and can breathe during their exam. Um, And so, (laughs) so those are physical traits, you know, as well as inform our stereotypes that, that kind of, um, I think bridge, you know, that between a physical trait and a behavioral, you know, trait that you want to see. Exactly. There's a lot that goes into our own preferences in combining all of it, especially in in the um, veterinary profession where we're bombarded with experiencing so many different pets and so many different breeds. I think it is interesting the way our mind works to kind of, I, I love, I don't know about you, I love hearing what sort of pets, vets, and vet staff own because I do feel like we have so much information and everyone winds up with a different breed because everyone has different, um, has developed different stereotypes or different opinions or different preferences. And it's fascinating to me. Um, And when we talk about breed stereotypes, I think I, you know, I want to talk about, I feel like we've talked about a few cons of, you know, maybe some of our stereotyping, but when we talk about the pros of stereotyping, you know, do you feel, Alyssa, like there are are pros and how do the stereotypes help us or pet owners? Yeah, I think certainly that, I mean, so like you said, looking at the schedule, looking ahead during the day, I'm a schedule looker. That's something that's fascinating to me too. Totally unrelated topic. Some people don't (laughs) look at their schedule and know what's coming in. That would drive me crazy. I have to look at my whole schedule. I like to look the day up, yeah. but like I don't need to look. Okay. I don't want to know the day before and be stressed about anything. <laughs> but I want to look the day up so that I can yes, be prepared. Too. Okay, good. I'm glad we're on the same page there. <laughs> um, but but because of that, you know, I look at the breed that's coming in, you know, I and that can help me prepare, um, you know, get things ready. If I think I'm going to need, you know, an extra hand, if I'm going to need a muzzle, if I'm going to need to, you know, um, get a patient right into a room, you know, not even mm-hmm. talking about aggression, but is it a patient that I'm worried is going to be a little bit, you know, more fearful uh, because of its breed? Um, so I definitely sure. think there are there are breeds that I stereotype as as fearful, as as more excitable ones that I don't want sitting in the waiting room forever getting all worked up. I agree. Like if you see a pug nail trim at, you know, 6 p.m., you're not going to send the whole staff home and do it yourself. Like that sort of a thing. I think sometimes those stereotypes we use a lot practically in the, um, you know, in the vet clinic particularly. And then I think when it comes to pet owners and some of the stereotypes, again, not all the stereotypes are correct, but I feel like some of the stereotypes can be helpful for people that are choosing pets. You know, if they see a terrier, maybe we know it's going to be high energy or that the odds are that it's going to be high energy. And I feel like it can, some of those stereotypes can help predict odds of a certain behavior that a pet may, or the pet owner may or may not want to be looking for. Um, and so for that reason, I think it, it can be helpful for us to form those stereotypes and help educate our pet owners. 
Um, again, like we said, they're not always correct. And I do think there are, of course, cons. I have had people come in, of course, devastated because they can't move. You know, they're moving into an apartment complex that doesn't allow a pit bull or something like that, that is based not at all on the individual pet and has everything to do with breed stereotypes. And I think sometimes that can be devastating. But there are, you know, but those are limitations and realities that we have to deal with every day, you know. So yeah, it's interesting that, you know, you, uh, you said about um, owners having stereotypes, on um, you know, what dog they're adopting. Do you ever ask owners that? Um, like if they come in with a bulldog or something, like sometimes that's my first question. <laughs> Have you owned one of these before? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a much more PC question. I thought you meant like, what were you thinking <laughs> as your, as your initial question? Um, it is, yeah, you know, it's fascinating because you sometimes are like, oh, I guess people maybe don't have as many stereotypes as would be beneficial for them because you'll see, you know, I have a few maybe older clients that will come in with very high energy breeds mm-hmm. and um, things like that, that you think, well, maybe a little more <laughs> exposure to these stereotypes would have been helpful. I also think sometimes there are wrong stereotypes. Mm-hmm. Like when we talk about greyhounds, I know whenever I would walk my greyhounds around, they'd be like, oh, I would love a greyhound, but just I don't have much room for them to run. <laughs> I'm like, they need zero room for them to run. <laughs> So it is really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yep. I've I've had that my whole career too. You know, same thing with, with big dogs and, and Great Danes. They make wonderful apartment dogs because they sleep mm-hmm. on the couch for, you know, 18 hours a day. <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly. It's, it's always fascinating to see what kind of um, stereotypes people are exposed to and whatnot. So Alyssa... I think this has been a fun conversation. Hopefully we didn't um, anger anyone offend too many. <laughs> yeah, we didn't go to too many dark places with uh, <laughs> any breed because, of course, everybody's an individual. Yes. So it's important to emphasize. Yes, they are. Um, but I think that leads us to our win of the week that we like to do every week. Alyssa, do you have any wins that you've experienced this week, either professionally or on a personal note? Yeah, so I actually have a win. Um, my parents got a dog. They have not had a dog for years and years since, you know, before I went to college, I had, you know, dogs when I was little. Um, And so we always had them, but they had been dogless for a very long time. And they actually had had a dog fall into their lap. Um, It's kind of in a similar situation to how I have acquired my current dog, um, you know, (laughs) from a family member that that could no longer keep it. And they're very happy. So that was exciting. It's great. I mean, you have to tell us the breed now, right? Oh, yes, I do. Because it's not a breed that I would have chose. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> so it, it's a puggle. Um, at least we're pretty Aww. sure it's a puggle. The the family member that had had the had the dog before my parents acquired it got it from the local shelter. Um, I can definitely Cute. see a lot of the pug, a little maybe of the beagle. You know, it's got a little longer snout. It's it's probably mostly pug. So again, not what I would have chosen. Cute. But they weren't looking for a dog. You know, they didn't go out specifically and get a dog. And and honestly, it's been a good fit. You know, it's a smaller dog, so it's easier for them. My, both my parents are in their late seventies now. So that's great. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, I think one negative when we talk about stereotypes is sometimes we overthink things. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's great. I'm sure the dog will be wonderful. I'm not going to volunteer for any of its nail trims, but otherwise (laughs) I'm sure it will be great. Um, and let's see, my win is very non-dog related, but it's such a big win. I'm going to share it anyway. And that that is, um, no one in my house has been sick this week, which Yay. I have a, a one and a half year old and he started daycare, I would say about 13 or 14 weeks ago. And last week was the first week that he went to school and didn't get sick. So he has had some weeks where he's been healthy, but it's only because he's been home sick the previous week. Mm-hmm. So we are living a new lease on life. We're going to have knock on wood, two full weeks of daycare in a row with no missed days. So if that's not a win, I don't know what it is. It is a huge win. It is a huge, huge <laughs> win. So I promise those days get better. <laughs> Although I would have that's to say- That's what I need you to tell no, me. No, they do. 
They do. I would have to say this has been a bad, you know, sick year in our family too. You know, I think I'm sure for a lot of people after COVID re-entering the world mm-hmm. that there is yep. a rise in all of these, you know, respiratory and stomach things. And we had our share as well this this year. Exactly. Fun times. I'm sure knock on wood next winter will be better, I, right? Yep. Can't be worse. That's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> Well, thank you everyone for listening. I hope you guys enjoyed our conversations and we look forward to sitting down again. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Veterinary Break Room. If you enjoyed today's episode, you can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts, including a video version on YouTube. While you're there, make sure you subscribe, rate, and review. You can also listen or watch our podcast episodes on our website at cliniciansbrief.com slash podcasts, or drop us a line at podcasts at briefmedia.com. Veterinary Break Room is a brief media production produced by Alexis Ussery and co-hosted by Dr. Alyssa Watson and Dr. Beth Mollison.